Hi everyone, welcome back to the Car Chat Podcast, or welcome to for the first time. I'm here with Andrew Frankel. Hello. Hi, how are you? Very good, very good. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about sort of who you are, what you do? Yeah, um, I am, as you say, I'm Andrew Frankel. I, I'm me, I'm a motoring journalist. I, I drive cars and I, and I write about them. Um, that's the sort of the day job. I've been obsessed with cars since I was, well, since I could walk. And I've been, I've been unbelievably blessed to get in and out of more amazing cars than I ever imagined I'd even get to see in my life. So, yeah, so I just, I, I'm a scribbler. I drive cars and I write about them. Every sort of week... I, I see a new article on Drive Nation or on your Instagram or something, and it, you're always in something really quite cool, often racing. And uh, I'm very jealous occasionally of, of the things you get yeah, to do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I can't make anyone feel sorry for me. Um, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you tend to really see the good stuff um, mm. and you don't tend to see the you know, the hours you spend arranging it or, you know, just inputting the information and the data. And so, um, yeah, I'm I'm blessed. I really am. I'm a very, very lucky boy and I've got to do some some amazing things. I've just got to kind of try and convince you that it's not all sort of um, beer and skittles. But um, what would be a typical sort of hours ratio of driving a car to effort in? Oh, God. Um, Depends. Well, I mean, it depends on the car. I mean, some cars just turn up. Um, I mean, I sit. I sit on a thing called the Car of the Year jury, which means I have to drive everything that goes on sale. And those cars, because car manufacturers uh, obviously wants their cars to be judged, and it's not practical for me to go to them for everyone. So those things just kind of tend to turn up. And so in there, the ratio would be, you know, massively more driving than setting it up. If you're talking about some you know, fairly exotic track test, it could be, or even road test. I mean, the McLaren F1, which I road tested for auto car back in 1994, that took two years. Um, <laughs> two years of patient negotiation, trying because they, they, because they they'd always said they were only ever going to let one publication do the numbers on the car. Yeah. Um, and we spent two years trying to persuade them that it should be us. Um, so it, it varies wildly, but I mean, I certainly spend more time organising stuff than I do driving it. Yeah, I think that's the same for a lot of people. But we, as, as an audience and as a consumer, you get to just see the the highlight highlight reel. Exactly. So, okay, where did this all start? This all started with my father, um, who was he was so possessed with cars that when he came to a career crossroads and he could either have been a lawyer or an accountant, he decided to become an accountant only because he'd get to drive to audits. <laughs> um, so that was literally it. He, yeah, he chose his career path and, he, became, and he, he took on the world's most boring profession because it would allow him to drive. I have two older brothers um, who were kind of brought up in the same environment and and to me it was just it was just kind of one of those things it, i don't think it ever occurred to me in my early life that everybody wasn't obsessed with cars because mm. you know we all get up and we brush our teeth and we you know we we we, we eat food and, and we talk about cars because that's what people do uh, and that's the way my life was cars were just as integral to my life as you know any of the things that anybody else does all the time they were just they were just part of it it, it never struck me in my early years as being in any way strange it was only when i kind of got out and about and people weren't like me and didn't think like me that i realized that you know i i, I was you know blessed uh, or cursed depending on which way you look at it to <laughs> to have this this extraordinary passion yeah did you i i, I was i'm sort of the opposite almost i, I didn't really get into cars until later way uh, later okay. like 20 I, I was a fleeting interest but more like 22 and then onwards was, um, was, was that was that a moment for you or was it a sort of gradual awakening? it was a gradual thing i think yeah. because no one at home was really interested in cars at all so there was no one really around me that was mad obsessed yeah until later on and then through friends i started getting more exposure and yeah going to some events and then it and then started taking pictures and it all sort of evolved and it started going down that rabbit hole of knowing the differences between you know version one and version two because of yeah. the headlights and and that sort of that sort of wagon but um so where did you where did you first start was writing the first thing you did oh, in, in cars no, no, no absolutely not no no i i i fell into motoring journalism um through really just being hopeless at everything else. So, um, you know, I, I it never occurred to me 
to do what I do because mm. motoring journalists were my heroes. I mean, I grew up in the 70s and 80s with guys like Mel Nichols and Gavin Green and Steve Cropley and George Bishop and Leonard Setright and you know, all, all the famous old names. I, I never considered myself to be, you know, worthy of even thinking about doing what they mm. did for a living. So, you know, I did what, you know, a lot of uh, people who've been sort of educated privately but were too thick or lazy to get any exam results or even get to go to university. So I, I just decided I was going to go and be something in the city. Hmm. And so this was in the late 80s. And I went, uh, I was a bond dealer briefly. I was a commodity broker briefly. I got fired from both of those. And then I decided that I'd get serious and get myself a professional qualification. But I couldn't go to university, but I managed to find a place in West Kensington that would teach me how to be a lawyer if I paid for it. And I'd, I'd inherited some money. Um, but I, I lasted two years of that. Um, so I almost got a law degree, um, but not quite. <laughs> And then I kind of ran out of ideas and um, I was literally, I was sitting at home, you know, staring into the abyss uh, of what my life was looking like it was going to be when, what happened? A friend of my brother told my brother about an advert in The Guardian, which I didn't, certainly didn't read, um, looking for a, you know, a, an office assistant at Autocar. And my brother told me, and, I, and probably the only smart thing I ever did was to ring up because the ad was so old by this stage uh, yeah. to see if the job was still available. And they said it was, but only because they'd had so many applications, they hadn't time to go through them all. And I said, is there anything I can do to make mine stand out a bit? And they said, yeah, r rather stupidly. And remember, I hadn't seen the ad. The ad had only asked for CVs. And so no one had written anything. So they said, we don't know if any of these guys can write. So if you wrote <laughs> something, that might help. And I had, a, what, I had a Renault 5 at the time, and my brother had a secretary who could type. Um, so I wrote some rubbish. She typed it up. We sent it in. I got an interview, and, you know, hey, presto, off you go. Perfect. Um, not a particularly conventional route into the business, but it, it worked for me. So then did you then sort of get a baptism of fire on journalism and testing cars? Yeah, I mean, autocar is, I mean, I think it still is today. It is, you know, if you want to learn the trade, there is nothing like a weekly car magazine on which to do it because, you know, they can't take passengers. Um, you know, you can't not know your stuff, you, you know, because it comes out, you know, every single week, you've got to produce 100 and something pages of, you know, of decent quality editorial. Um, and, and I very, very nearly didn't make it because when I got there, they'd realized how much I'd lied about all the stuff that I'd done <laughs> and how well I could write and, and all this sort of stuff. And I, I was inevitably royally found out. Um, and in fact, it was Mel Nichols, um, former editor of Car Magazine, who by this stage was the editorial director of Haymarket, who instead of just saying, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, he looked at my work and he said, well, it is rubbish, but I can see why it's rubbish. And this is what you need to try to do to put it right. So he actually did something positive and, and he kind of turned it around. And if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. I'd be, you know, back at home watching daytime. Hmm. Has your journalism changed a lot over the years? Do you, like if you look obviously if you look back at the early stuff you'd be like oh that's yeah you see I don't I mean I'm one of these I mean I can't bear to watch myself on film which is why I appear <laughs> on it so rarely um, and I don't really spend an awful lot of time going back and reading stuff that I've written I don't even remember a lot of stuff I mean there, there have been many occasions when I have been researching something and I've been researching it online and I found, found some old article. I've gone in there to read it and discovered to my complete surprise that I've written it. Um, so, but when that happens, and that really is pretty much the only time I look back at, back at what I used to do, uh, I don't think I'm a very good judge of it. I don't think that... I, I Hopefully, I'm a better writer than I used to be. I'm certainly a better driver than I used to be. But I think the approach is the same because, you know, I don't really have an approach. I just say what I feel. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to be able to write to whatever the standard is, um, sufficient to be able to keep me, you know, busy for the last, whatever it is, 30 something years I've been doing this. So I would like to think that I've improved, but I think the fundamental approach is the same because it, it, it's all I can do. Mm. Do, you, do you struggle at times when you drive so many cars and yeah. let's say... Let's say it was a modern, what, I don't know, something. A modern Fiesta box. or something like yeah. that. Like distinguishing between all of the different cars in that category and then yes, coming up with it's, something it's, it's different. It's a real problem and, and, and it is increasingly becoming so. 
Um, although it's been that way for quite a long time. I, I once did a thing for Autocar where we had Volkswagen Golf, an Audi A3, a Seat Leon, and a Skoda Octavia. And I opened <laughs> the bonnets of them all and tried to find any differences. And literally every clip, every hose, every pipe, every everything between these four cars from completely different brands was literally identical. Uh, and that was probably the thick end of 20 years ago. And it, and it hasn't got any easier since then. And I think that cars these days are becoming um, less distinct. And, and that's not always the car maker's fault. There's so much regulation um, that they have to go through. You know, frankly, you know, 90% of the car designs itself these days. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it is a problem, but it's also it's also what the job requires. So you know you have to try to find those key points of difference. And I guess that at the moment, you know, when you've got you know petrol cars, diesel cars, electric cars, hybrid cars, you know, there there, there are clear differentiators there. But yeah, I mean, you know, unless you're talking about on the fringes, so if you're talking about sports cars or supercars, um, you know, the main block in the middle, you know, you could be forgiven for looking at it as a fairly amorphous blob. Yeah, and, and I think for for most consumers, it seems like, like they just want a car, whereas well, that will do yeah. the job and blah 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 blah. Whereas I think the the real I, I, no, I, sorry, what would you say? I, I, yeah, I, I think I think they think they just want a car, but you know, there's so much other stuff, and and this frust this frustrates me because. You know, my job is to you know is to advise people what, what, what to do, and you know, and 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 in order to do that job, I drive everything. And yet, you know, I see people. I mean, you know, I guess the case in point are these sort of crossover SUVs, the sort of the, the Nissan Qashqai's and all those sorts mm. of things. And I don't want to be rude to the people who design them because they're designed to a brief, and I'm sure they they execute that brief very well. But to me, these are cars that do nothing well. You know, they're not particularly spacious or fun or economical or fast or refined or comfortable. I mean, they're just, they're kind of like the ultimate jacks of all trades. And I, and I just think that, and it is frustrating because you think, you know, there are so many cars out there that people could go and buy, which would do the job they require of them so much better. But of course, and this is where I I start to struggle. People don't buy cars because they are the cars that they need. People buy cars because that's what they think that they want. And so much of the time it's to do with, for instance, the image they think that car projects of them. And people will quite happily buy entirely inappropriate cars because they think it says the sort of right sorts of things. And, and because I guess I've never really understood that, uh, well, I understand that it happens. I don't understand why it happens. I don't understand the mind of the person who thinks like that. I don't really understand why people make these peculiar buying choices. And, and as I said, I do find it slightly frustrating. Do you not think these some of these manufacturers just like sneak under your skin though? And if you had to choose between, oh, I don't know, like something with a Porsche badge and something else you might like i know i have a slight leaning towards porsche but it's for for me it's like it's for a lot of reasons and, I, and yeah, it's impossible is it impossible is it possible to drive a car without being aware of the brand and all of the stuff that goes with that at all no it's not there is a level of expectation and of course we should look at every car objectively and regardless of who's created it um but you can't do that uh, but whether that affects your judgment of the car is a different question mm. and and i don't think that it does and i've never thought that it does and you know if if that were the case you know i i, I would all i would just offer up you know uncritical you know hagiographies of you know every ferrari or porsche that that i've driven and i don't do that um i think and actually in in, in some regards because the level of expectation with certain brands is so high, uh, if they fail to meet it or if they do something which you really weren't expecting, then, you know, the fall can be that much further. Yeah. Whereas if somebody comes along and you don't expect much and it turns out to be brilliant, then, wow, you know, that's, you know, that's, that, that, that's different and that's interesting and that's a proper story. And we as journalists, we're always looking for stories. So, you know, I, I, I don't think there's anything more boring than, you know, Porsche coming out with a new 911 and us all going, wow, that's great. Yeah. Annoyingly, that tends to be the case. Um, you know, there's a bit of me, there's a professional bit of me that wishes they'd come out with with a really rubbish one because that would that would be interesting, and I would enjoy explaining where they'd gone wrong. 
um, because I know that people would find that interesting to read or to hear, but it doesn't happen very often. Yeah, yeah. Have you got a car you've driven recently where you feel like there is that gap between expectation and result? Yeah, the Ferrari SF90. Okay, yeah. Very interesting car. You know, it's extremely capable. It's got a thousand horsepower and you can drive it sideways until it runs out of tires. So, you know, in those sort of Ferrari terms, it ticks those boxes. What is strange about it, though, is it's obviously their, it's their flagship car. It's the most expensive production car they now make. But the operative word is production. So it's not a limited edition car. You know, they'll make as many of them as mm. they can sell. So it's not a car that's going to appeal to the collectors. And yet... You know, it's got this driven front axle, which means it basically has no boot or such a tiny boot. You can't actually go anywhere. And it's certainly not with anyone. So I think to myself, well, what's it for? <laughs> you, know, you can't go on holiday in it. And it's presumably not going to be an appreciating asset. It's heavy. You know, they, I think they say it weighs like 15, 70 kilos, but then you realize it's a dry weight, so that's 16, 70 kilos. And then they say that's with the Assetto Fiorano pack on all lightweight options and that, you know, you can add another 100 kilos. So yeah. you're talking about, a, I mean, I would think that if you plonked a, an SF90, a standard SF90 with no options on the scales with a tank of gas in it, it would weigh the thick end of 1,800 kilos, which is a lot. And when you drive it, you know, however amazing it is, and it is absolutely amazing in some of the things that it can do, you know, not even that can defy the laws of physics. So, yeah, I got out of it into an F8, which still has whatever it has, 710 yeah. horsepower, um, but is a lot lighter and felt much more nimble. And at no stage did I ever think, oh gosh, I wish this had another 300 horsepower. But lots of the time, I did appreciate the fact that it was just more communicative. It just felt more, you know, organic in its responses. And I found myself wondering what Ferrari had achieved by all the weight that it added with that electrically driven front axle, all the boot space that it lost because of it. And yeah, as I say, it's, it's, it's a strange, strange car. I mean, very, very impressive in many ways. But I think a car that, to answer a short question with a very long answer, I think is a car which asks more questions than it answers. Yeah, I'm totally, at, at the moment, every now and then I'll go and, I mean, or you go and drive something really light, whether... I get to, I have a Radical, so I drive that occasionally, or yeah. you go and drive a Caterham or something, yeah. and then you get back into basically any modern, not not quite, but any modern sports car, supercar, even something like an M2 mm. or M3, they're yeah. all so heavy. Yeah. And, yeah. and and you can't engineer your way around that. I did a, not long after lockdown, <laughs> the last lockdown um, <laughs> stopped, I spent a week in a, Caterham Super 7. So that's their sort of classic looking one. It's the one yeah. with, the, with the, uh, the sort of the flowing wings and it's got the spare wheel on the back and all the worldly instruments. And it was this is one of the cheapest Caterhams you can buy. The 1600 engine, 135 horsepower, no limited slip diff in it. And they just, you know, basic mm. and beautiful. 500 kilos. And I just couldn't have been happier in it. I was, you know, I just spent, you know, I just found myself once again, and this is a rare thing in my business because I drive so much, I found myself looking for excuses to drive it. Yeah. You know, can I go and do the shopping? Can I collect <laughs> the kid? Can I, you know, what do whatever? Um, because I just loved being in it. And it, it's, you know, you find, you know, so few cars these days are, you know, normally aspirated with manual gearboxes and light and you know, all the things that I used to take for granted, all the things that, frankly, the way the cars used to be. And it saddens me that, you know, for various reasons, they have become heavier and more remote um, and less tactile and, and less involving to drive. Yeah, totally. I, I had a bit of an experience recently, and I, I know you've driven both the cars, so you'll, you'll be able to give me your thoughts. But I drove an, an F8. Um, I got to do like a sort of customer type thing. So 20 minutes on the road, 20 yeah. minutes around Goodwood. In all times, I had to have the car in sport. Yeah. I wasn't allowed oh, to have couldn't, it. In, uh, you couldn't put it into race I or couldn't CT or it at all. And right. um, I came back from the road drive and I couldn't be further from liking the car. I was, yeah. it was, it's very fast, all the stuff, blah, 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 blah. But in sport, you could just put, you could go to zero miles an hour and then mash it in second, like yeah. full on, just flat. And it would just go off like you're on yeah. just some, like an electric, just like zzz, make yeah. a bit of noise. 
you didn't get any sensation of any tires or car. No. Traction control systems have just got to that point now where they're so good that you have no idea other than what? you know yeah. that they're not working. And and then a bit of time around the track, Goodwood, I would say, is, is not the perfect get into some random supercar, you've got three laps. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not, not perfect. You, you're not going to explore much at that point in time. But I got out of the car and I was, I was really depressed. I was like, you know, oh, it's good, blah, 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 whatever. And got home and was just kind of upset that like I'd driven the latest Ferrari supercar. And but it you gave, hadn't driven it really. And it you gave me you nothing. It didn't feel like that. And I wondered, I wondered, I was like, well, if I put it in a lot more off. Yeah. I feel like I would have got a lot, a lot of that back. Just that sensation that there's consequences. Oh, without any question at all. I mean, um, the, the the SF90, I think, illustrates the point very well. You know, if you have that in sport, it is absolutely as you describe. <clears throat> and then you put it into what they call race, and it suddenly just starts oversteering everywhere. Um, <laughs> but it's oversteering. But it's a, but it's oversteering in a really clever way. That's the kind of hero mode because. Yeah. Any idiot can make it oversteer. And you see all these shots of me and other people, you know, coming out of corners, you know, on the lock stops, smoke, everything else. And you're and, and everybody looking at that thinking, wow, he can drive. And it's not you, you're almost not driving the car because the, the systems are so smart now. They will let you drift and drift and drift. And yet ultimately they're still in control. It's only when you go one further and yeah. turn the systems off that the car turns into a complete animal. And, you know, it turns into actually what it is, which is quite a heavy thousand horsepower car. <laughs> yeah. So there's an awful lot of momentum going on. And, and, and that's kind of when you earn, uh, earn your living. But no, I mean, I think if, if I drove an F8 and could never take it out of sport, I feel exactly the same way as you. Because yeah. I would feel I was, well, I said, you know, you hadn't really driven. I mean, I would feel that I hadn't driven the car. It's like, it's like taking uh, the cork out of a bottle of Petrus and only being allowed to sniff. <laughs> you know, you yeah. haven't. You haven't had the experience, have you? Um, and frankly, in, 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 in that scenario, I would genuinely rather not do it because it'd just be frustrating, as you found. That, and that was it. And then it was, it was literally backed up by the next day, just timetable, this is how it worked. I went down to GTO Engineering and drove the 250 short wheelbase, yeah. one of the yeah. competition spec ones. Yeah. <laughs> and then after, different. after about 10 minutes, I just stopped and was like, okay, this, okay. Is, this, just, this is what it's about. This is what it's about. Cars yeah. are still great, can be great. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I have spoken to a couple of guys in the industry recently. I know I mentioned this only because you, mem you mentioned that short wheelbase. And if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, GTO Engineering, they're Ferrari specialists, and they've created, I mean, they will go and make you effectively a brand new, you know, 1960 specification short wheelbase. So you have a brand new car, so it's not likely to go wrong. And yet it drives exactly the same as the car in which Sterling Moss won the RAC TT 60 years ago. And... These conversations that I had were people who were saying that because so many people have had their fingers burnt buying supercars recently, that they are now beginning to think, actually, you know, if I'm going to spend a lot of money on a fun car, you know, A, I want it to retain some of that value, and B, I just want something to enjoy, uh, which I can get out and use. And cars like that short wheelbase, which are so much more tactile and so much more evocative and emotional things to drive... You know, which you can now, but I can't remember what, how much they charge for those. Is it like 800? 800. 800, is it? Mm. Yeah. And you know, that's a lot of money. But, you know, compared to the money that people can spend on, on hypercars, it's, it's not so much. And, you know, I, I could see people increasingly going down that sort of road. Yeah. And there's only, get, with cars like that, there's only ever going to be hundreds in total. Like, yeah, ever. at the most. Yeah. Whereas your SF90. They will literally make as many as people order. There could be yes. thousands. Whether people will order them, I don't know. But I think a lot of people. I mean, Ferrari, Ferrari customers will. certainly expect that they will because you know they 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 would have limited the number. I mean, what I kind of hope is that the SF90 is a bit of a stalking horse, and what they're actually doing is proving their hybrid technology, and that the F8 replacement, which we see next year, I think, will have a lot of that stuff on it, but without the driven front axle. So you'll get your boot space back uh, and it'll be a couple of hundred horsepower down, but who cares? And, you know, and, and, and that could be, you know, a rear drive, you know, production hybrid Ferrari you can actually use. Interesting car. Interesting. Um, but but who, who knows? I mean, I don't, I don't know any better than you. I know they're, they're hampered by regulations and none of these companies really, I think, want to make necessarily 
a, a fully electric car or a hybrid no. or something. Like if you said to me, I just said to you, you can have a 500 horsepower, thousand kilo car, manual gearbox revs to like nine or something. Yep. Yep. I'd yeah. have that over any, any, anything. Yeah. So of course, I, I can remember saying this when the when the Veyron, the Bugatti Veyron, first came out, and whenever it was two thousand and five, and it had it was a two ton car that had a thousand horsepower, and I can just remember saying if it had been a one car ton one <laughs> ton car with five hundred horsepower, you know, it would have the same power to weight ratio, but it would just be, I mean, immeasurably better to drive. Yeah. Um, but you know, I can, I was talking to Mike Fluitt, the CEO of McLaren about these sorts of things. And, you know, Mike is, you know, he is a lightweight obsessive. Um, mm. You know, he has, you know, a few nice old racing cars and they're all old Lotuses just because that's the way he likes them. To, um, and he was explaining that however much, you know, he personally is much more interested in lightweighting than adding power, you know, he has to make the customer, the cars that his customers want. Yeah. And his customers, you know, if the cell, if you can imagine you're the CEO of a company like McLaren and you go, well, here's our next car. And the really good news is it's got less power than the last one. I mean, they'd just walk away, wouldn't they? Can't you just and, flip and it and say it's still faster? Yeah. And you can say it's still faster and it's lighter and, but. No, it doesn't uh, sell. Well, I mean, and, 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 and I think actually, and I think we are. As, as a bunch of, you know, of, of writers and presenters or whatever, I think we are doing our best to turn the tide. But the time has to come um, when people start to focus on something other than pure power and power to weight or just weight or something. Because, you know, we are now getting into the era, aren't we, of the 2,000 horsepower car. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, you know, I've well, the most powerful car I've ever driven had 1,200 horsepower. And, you know, if you get into... You know, a modern electric car like a Porsche Taycan Turbo S, which has, yeah. I think, 710 or something, uh, and you put your foot down. It's a genuinely uncomfortable experience. There is yeah. nothing nice at all about accelerating from naught to whatever speed you like in an electric car with 700 horsepower. So what's it going to be like with three times that power? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's almost as if these people who are making these electric cars have thought to themselves, well, we can't make them sound good. We can't let people change gear. There's no tactility to it. So we will do the only thing that electric cars can do is we'll just do more of that. And so we'll just have more and more power. And I just, it's just the wrong way. It's just the wrong way because it makes cars heavier and you're providing power people can't use and ultimately won't like. Mm. What go. have you Went driven over. with 1,200 horsepower? Uh, what was it? Well, uh, in road cars, uh, the Veyron Supersport. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. I haven't driven a Chiron, but um, yeah. And a racer, yeah, and the 91730 among racing cars had about, what, about 1,100, didn't it? <laughs> and so, I bet that's quite different to a, a modern electric car. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Not least because I think it weighed about 850 kilos. Yeah. 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 Mad. Mad. Properly, properly mad. Wonderfully insane. Is that is that well up there on your the race cars you've driven? Completely, completely up there. Um, I mean, I, I am often asked, you know, what's the greatest racing car you've ever driven, and I always give a slightly unsatisfactory answer because so much of it depends on the rules that go with getting to drive it. Yeah, um, and I've been in racing cars where there's been an owner who's kind of initially said yes and then thought twice about it but is now committed but doesn't really want you in the car because oh no, I completely understand that because if I had some of the cars that I've driven I wouldn't want anybody in them but yeah. they say okay well you've only got this number of laps and you can't use that number more than that number of revs uh, and you've got to keep it off the curbs and you know just I don't, you know just just drive it slowly and that gets back to your what you were talking about about driving the F8 in sport. Um, it's just you come out of it uh, feeling that you haven't driven the car. The wonderful thing about something like the 91730 is because this was Porsche's car, um, and because I've driven a few of their things in the past, they just they just give you the car. Nice. No one ever said to me, "Don't use more than this number of revs." There was the telltale on the rev counter at eight four or whatever it is, which was as much as ever used when it was racing. So I just used that, um, <laughs> and. And the deal is very simple, which is, you know, crash it or blow it up or in any way abuse the the privilege of being allowed to do this and you'll never get to do it again. Yeah. And that's all the incentive I need not to, you know, take the mick out of the people who've been kind enough to put me in their car. Um, so, so, so with something like the 91730, yeah, I had Goodwood. Uh, it was dry. 
uh, I had no restrictions on what I did, and and it was actually that as much as the car itself, which makes it right up there among the the most amazing things I've ever done in the car. How does those how have sort of prototypey cars evolved? Have you driven a modern prototype? Um, ish. Yeah, well, modern. I mean, so I can't fit into sort of modern modern cars. Uh, I'm just, I'm six foot four and about ah. sixteen stone, so I, I can't fit into p1 or p2 cars but i've driven you know i've driven lots of group c cars um mm. so cars with you know proper ground effect proper downforce and they're just different um i, I mean I, i'm fascinated by downforce because i don't really understand it um and that that weird sense you get that downforce gives you where the faster you go the easier it gets the faster you go the more precise the car comes you just find yourself hitting all your marks um and you get to the stage where you just think I could just drive this car. Everything becomes, you know, you think to yourself, every, every corner must ultimately be, be, be flat out because the faster I drive it, the easier <laughs> it becomes. I mean, I drove the the latest RSR Porsche, yes. the RSR 19, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and that is a car with, okay, it hasn't got a prototype amount of downforce, but it's got a lot of downforce. Um, yeah. It's sort of between five and 10 seconds a lap quicker than a GT3 car. And GT3 cars have a lot of downforce. And I drove it at Vallelunga, uh, which has lots of sort of downforce-friendly, medium to high-speed corners. And it's just it's just bizarre because it's, you know, it, it kind of, it feels like you're defying the laws of physics. Um, and then you get in some, you know, some nice old thing with no downforce at all and you can slide it around. And ultimately that's where my heart lies because A, I, I understand it easier. B, I can get to the limits of those cars much more easily. And I think, you know, we all agree that, you know, certainly when you're on track, it's driving a car on the limit. And, you know, something like the RSR, you know, you can, you can, I guess you can kind of move it about a bit in the slow corners, but in the really, really quick stuff, unless you went and did like two days testing, you know, yeah. somebody like me uh, would never get to the proper high speed limit of those cars. So ultimately, yeah, I think. I do prefer, I do enjoy the old stuff more just because it's that much more accessible and they tend to sound better and they tend to have manual gearboxes. And But the modern stuff does fascinate me because I don't really understand it. Yeah, it's it's very cool. How does something like a an R, let's say you took a GT3 RS and then yeah. you went GT3 Cup and then you yeah. went RSR. How does that evolution work? Well, it's very interesting. Of those three cars, the car I would most like to drive again is the Cup car. Mm. Um, and I did this quite recently. Um, I drove a GT3 RS and a Cup car at Silverstone. And then on a separate event, I went and drove the the RSR. The thing about the Cup car is... You know, it's really although it's a modern racing car, it's a very rare thing in that it's a completely old school modern racing car. You have no driver aids at all. Mm. You have no ABS. You have no traction control. There's nothing to save you. And you know, people go on about oh, you know, 911s don't handle like 911s used to handle, and they're all terribly safe. Well, cup cars aren't. Cup cars are proper challenges. I mean, I would say a cup car is. I mean, certainly somebody like me, it's a much more difficult car to drive than an RSR. I mean, the moment you've got the downforce, you've got stuff working in your favours. Um, and okay, those. So the uh, the RSR doesn't have ABS, but it has it has traction control, which you can program a for the point of intervention and b for the amount of intervention, and that can get you out of a world of pain. And you've got the downforce. Cup car doesn't have any of that. But it also feels like a racing car, and that's the difference between the Cup car and the GT3 RS. GT3 RS is one of my favourite road cars, but you only need to get in a Cup car to realise that a GT3 RS is absolutely a road car. Yeah. Um, and it's got rubber in its suspension, and it's quite soft, and it's on street tyres. I mean, frankly, you know, the moment you put a slick and some racing suspension onto anything, it just feels like a completely different car. I mean, I can remember doing a track day with some GT4 cars. So it's so, you know, pretty junior stuff yeah. but because they had racing suspension and they were on slicks and there were so there were some really really amazing very very fast road cars out there and you know they're just like obstacles yeah you can just you just have to pick your way through them because you're just traveling so much faster so i love that cup car because it was so analog and it was just me and it and you know if anything had gone wrong no one could have pretended it was anybody's fault other than mine so i quite like that to, to the more you drive race cars, okay, and you've been driving race cars for a long time, does that almost yeah. sort of put you off road cars a little bit? In the sense um, that, like, I... I know, I, know, I know what you mean. I've often, I've often wondered how people who drive Formula One cars can get into fast road cars and go, wow, that's amazing. 
And they can't be. Come on, you yeah, drive Formula don't. One cars. <laughs> Um, but it's it's interesting. You can you just adapt because they are so different. It's it's just like you're having a completely different experience. It's like saying I don't know um, you can't like puddings because you just had a nice main course. I mean, it's just it's yeah. it's a completely different sort of thing. And you know, you get in a road car and you put your road car hat on and you drive road cars, you know, on the road in a very particular sort of way. And then you get into racing cars and yeah, I mean, there's there's so little that the two experiences have in common, both in the cars themselves and the way you drive them. Um, the, no, I've always been able, as long as the road car is good. I also, I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something else about road cars. I love cars that are good at the job they're designed to do. And I don't really care very much what that job is. So, you know, I've, I've recently I was in the Defender doing yeah. ridiculous things off-road with it. And I loved it because... It's authentic. It, it, it absolutely lives up to that badge on the front of it. It goes places you can't really believe cars should be able to go. I love. I was driving a, a what was I driving the other day? An Up GTI, so a tiny little yeah. city car. Loved it because it knew exactly what it was and what it was trying to do. And you know, an Alpine A110, another car I absolutely love because again, total focus on one particular job. And that is, I'm afraid, why I don't get on with these crossover SUVs because they're not trying to do anything. They're trying to do everything and they end up not doing any of it particularly well. So um, yeah, I just I just get in what I whatever it is I'm in, I I kind of in my head I have an understanding of what it should be doing. And then the entire experience is trying to find out whether it does it or not or how well it does it. Yeah, it's an interesting one that I had exactly the same well as sort of the experience of I got a rental car the other day and I was meant to have a Fiesta, something like a Fiesta, yeah. and they gave me an upgrade in advert commas and put me in some kind of crossover Ooh. Renault, I think. Mm. And uh, the first like go around a corner, immediately I'm like, yeah, I've got way less grip. Way, way less grip yeah. than I should have. It's it, and it was just, it was that exactly. Like it just was less stable driving down a road. Yeah. Suspension was like designed to be soft, but then had minimal roll and ride control. And I just took it back. And I was like, I wish, like, why is this considered an upgrade now? Yeah. Why exactly. is this we've what people been, are looking it's, for? It's, it's, we've all, there's a column in this, isn't there? We've all been upgraded out of the hard cars that we actually wanted. Yeah. We've all wanted a Fiesta and ended up in a, I don't know, a Vauxhall Mariva or something. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, a, it's not a very edifying experience. No, no, not at all. And then on the, the, like the road car thing, I find, and I'm always sort of sitting there and I'll have a friend and he'll be like, oh, what I would really love to do is daily drive a uh, 360 challenge race car. I'm like, no, you wouldn't. Nah, 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 nah. And then there's this sort of push nowadays for... Road going race cars is what they get called and marketed at. Yeah. Whether it's something like a GT3 RS yeah. or all those sorts of things. Sure. And the more I drive race cars, yeah. And the more I drive, get to drive things like a GT3 RS on track. You try, you get out of something like like a radical SR3. So I've got yeah. an SR3. Get out of that. 550 kilos, 250 horsepower, lots of downforce, and you get in a GT3 RS. You know. Yeah, that's that's it's it's quite like moves around a lot. It's really heavy. I feel like I'm destroying the brakes. Like mm. worry a little bit about the paint, all of that sort of stuff. And you're like, nah, actually. And then there's some middle ground for a road car because you don't want it to have too much grip. No, you don't. No, you and don't. we're all just going down more grip, stickier tires, more grip, stickier yeah. tires in cars yeah. that you would most people would never really take on a racetrack. Yeah, but the problem is. We are in a tiny, tiny minority. Um, yeah. You know, I think the the best example of what you're talking about is the Alpine A110. Mm. Um, and before that, the Toyota GT86. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, these are cars which both quite deliberately said, we're not going to do the going fast thing. We don't want lots of grip. We actually regard lots of grip as being something that gets in the way of driving enjoyment. We want cars that are light and feel nice and everything else. But, you know, I don't think it's any secret that, you know, Alpine has struggled to sell those cars, certainly in the UK. And, you know, the Toyota GT86, okay, they are going to replace it. But, I mean, it's not been a runaway success for them. No. You know, these are niche products. And I'm afraid we are niche people in that regard. And what we want is not what most people want. And, you know, you can't blame car manufacturers for making cars that their customers ask for, even if those cars are not the kind of cars that you or I would instinctively like to go out and buy. Yeah. 
It's a shame, but it's, it, it is the way of the world, I'm afraid. It is, and it's, it's, it endlessly gets repeated, all those guys that are like, oh, they're getting rid of the manual, I don't know, whatever, yeah, M3 me. or something, and... And and then someone will come back and say, yeah, but are you going to order one new? Because if you're not going to order one new, exactly, it's never it's never going to happen. Do you think the Alpine A110? I, I've not driven one yet. I'd love to have a driving one at some point. But it was very much pitched at enthusiasts. Yeah. Do you think if it had a manual gearbox, they would have sold more? No. No. <sighs> Would it? Because um, I mean, I've, I've obviously I had this convers I had this conversation with them, and they said the numbers simply didn't support it. They would have sold more cars, but would so with, so. But are you asking whether they would have sold more manuals than paddles? I don't know. I mean, the thing for them was no um, overall cars. Yeah, would yeah, they have sold yes, overall yeah, they, more it, cars? It would have increased their sales. Whether the cost of homologating a manual A one ten would have been more than offset by those increase in sales. I can't say. I mean, the, the problem is, is that that powertrain, as you know, is a kind of plug and play thing. It's, a, you know, it's, it's Renault mm. McGann stuff, and it's on the shelf. And instead of being in the front, driving the front wheels, it's in the back, driving the rear wheels. And they take it off the shelf and they bung it in. And you don't have to think too hard about it. Now, I'm being terribly simplistic, but I'm oversimplifying it. And it was more difficult than that. But to go from that to actually finding a manual gearbox and engineering it and homologating. I mean, that's a big job for a car yeah. that's always going to be very low volume. And ultimately... They decided the demand wouldn't be there. But would I like it even more than I do? Um, on, on, on Drive Nation, which, if people don't know about it, is a, an Instagram site that me and my mate Dan Prosser have. We've been doing it for about two and a half years. And, 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 we, and we just try to do journalism on Instagram uh, because, you know, it's certainly when we started doing it, nobody else was. And you can read proper road tests and features and interviews. Can you, and that can sort of you way. tell the audience like a little, little summary of? of how exactly. you go about it because yeah. you do it a bit differently exactly uh, and we do these road tests and like everybody we rate our cars out of 10 except for us the best car in its class is not a 10 out of 10 it's a 9 out of 10 car to be a 10 out of 10 you've got to be genuinely game changing in the two and a half years we've been doing this we've only had one 10 out of 10 car which was the Alpine um because it did feel like something completely different it did feel like someone who had really sat down and thought about what you know, proper enthusiasts want from their cars. And it's exactly what you're talking about. It's not all about power and grip. It's about lightness and it's about feel. It's about involvement. It's about compact dimensions. It's about the very, and, and they sound a bit boring when you're just talking about like that. But actually, if you combine those elements into a car and stick it on a decent road, you just get magic. Mm. Um, and yeah, so yeah, so, so we gave that a 10 out of 10. And as I say, it's the only car we've, that, that we've done that to so far. Yeah. No, I, I do quite enjoy your little summaries of various things. Um, what was I'm I glad. looking at today? Alpina B3 Touring. There now, you go. Alpina as a company, I find it's quite an interesting one because I love the concept of their cars and the fact that they're, you know, meant to be more comfy, better riding, bit a bit more juice, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. But then like that that's another one. I, I don't know I don't know the answer. The, whenever I would look at something, let's say like a B3 Touring, I would also look at the BMW, yeah. whatever version of that and that sort of thing. And personally, I would lean towards the BMW or something else just because the Alpinas are so much more expensive. Yeah, I mean, it depend, depends what you're comparing it to. I mean, if you compare like a B5 to an M5 or this B3 to an M3, I mean, the prices aren't that far away. I mean, the one that I've got here at the moment is about 65 grand. Yeah. Um, and I just always like the way that Alpina have done stuff um, because, again, it's a much more subtle approach. I mean, they, they, they don't go chasing the numbers and they do soften things off and they, their cars do ride very, very well. And I like the way that they look. You know, I certainly think that if you bought yourself a new B3, you could do that on, you know, if you've seen what the next M3 is going to look like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, um, you might consider that a B3 is that that's grounds on its own to go and buy an Alpina. I mean, it's, it's interesting. You say I did a test between a B5 and an M5 yeah. a couple of years ago, I suppose. Um, both so they both had 600 horsepower and you know yeah and whatever. And I prefer the Alpina, but then mm. again, I'm a middle aged bloke, and you know I've been doing this for a while, and I've got and I've got over you know um road cars trying to feel you know overtly sporting and there's a bit of me quite a lot of me that would appreciate a car that rides really really well 
Um, because in, often, on, certainly on British roads, that makes them handle better too, because yeah. they can cope with the lumps and the bumps and, and everything else. I had an interesting one this week, and I, I don't know whether you've driven it. I drove the new F-Type 4, whatever it's called, 4, 10, 30, 50. It's the detuned V8 that's replaced oh, no, the V6. Driven, no, I've driven, so I've, I've driven the sort of standard um, with the old, yeah, with, with the, the, the kind of the full fat V8. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what did you think of it? Well, so I drove the, we didn't drive, the, there's now a four cylinder F type. We didn't drive that one. Then we drove yeah. this one. There are no, which there are is, no six cylinders left. Yeah. So this replaces the six. Yeah. And you can still get that with front, with, with four wheel drive and rear wheel drive. You can get it. I, th- I don't know whether it's just rear wheel drive. Okay. It might just be rear wheel drive. So we drove that and then we drove an R. So the, and the R was four wheel drive and yeah. more horsepower and stuff like that. Yeah. But I I drove that car and it was just at their test sort of facility, Fen End, so sort of yeah, like Melbourne yeah. type place. And the the middle one, the I really should find out what that one's called. It's, it's called the four something, but it's, it's a detuned four eight with four hundred ish horsepower, yes. four hundred and a bit more. But the way the ride was set up was like kind of comfy like mm. it, in the normal mode not in the sportier mode it would yeah. absorb most bumps and just as a thing to drive around in it was really nice and then if you go up to the r the r basic sort of setting is stiffer than the stiffer of the the middle one yeah. and i don't get in that car and go like oh this is like a serious hardcore sports car like lightweight type thing mm. so it's more of a gt car to me yeah. so and that, why wouldn't you make it ride properly and why wouldn't you just have the option at least to have and they all they all look fine but if you're in the r you feel you feel all the stuff you go over a little bump and it's like you mm. feel it and immediately i the others the different people and it's, i guess it's different strokes for different folks but like so the other guys i was with preferred the r they're like it's got more horsepower, more, 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 whatever. And I was like, nah, that doesn't that doesn't interest me at all. I would rather have rear wheel drive, and the ride quality for me was like this is way nicer. This will yeah. be way nicer car to drive around yeah. as a using as a normal car. Yeah, and as you say, you know, it's not a GT3 RS. It's never going to be. It's not even a 911 Turbo. So, you know, I think cars like that they should play to their strengths um, and also to their brand values. Um, and Jaguars to me have always been you know, the most comfortable of sporting mm. cars, if not sports cars. Um, and so, as you say, why would you not, given that you clearly have the ability because you've done it in another car to provide that level of comfort, why not give people the choice? Yeah. Don't know. I guess it's just... Because there'll be some bloke in marketing who says, oh, no, the R has to be more sporting. Yeah. You can't have an R being softer than an or as soft as the next one down. And so wherever that one stops, the R has to start a bit yeah. above it. There needs to be a um, noticeable difference. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I suspect, I don't know, I, I suspect they probably didn't spend long enough actually talking to customers who use these cars. But then again, I don't know, because for me now looking at it, I would go, if I was looking at those cars, 100% I would have the middle one. I would not even remotely go anywhere near the rest of them because it see, I, I, ticks I, all the boxes. I'm that much older than you. I'd just have the four-cylinder because it's so much lighter. And okay. because it's not, and it would, it would I mean, I know, I, mean I, haven't, okay, I haven't driven the four-cylinder, the two-liter four-cylinder version of the kind of facelifted F-Type. Yeah. But of the previous generation, it was the one I liked the most because it was it was simple. You know, it was not terribly quick, but it's got three hundred and something horsepower, so it wasn't slow. And I just I just liked the way it went down the road. I liked the fact that it wasn't nose heavy, um, mm. and it felt quite you know, it felt much more poised than the other ones. And you know, it felt you know at fifty grand rather than yeah. ninety grand or whatever they are is these days. You know, it felt like a credible rival for a sort of you know bottom end. Came and Audi, whatever. Whereas the R is sort of, you know, having a go at 911 and Carrera S's yeah. and, it, and it's, you know, it's not there. Yeah. I, I thought the the move from V6, which was the one generally everyone liked previously, yeah. but, but to a V8 though, as a not pushing it hard, not just for like most car usage, that, yeah. the very nature that it now has a V8, I was like massive tick. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and it's not, you know, Jaguar aren't the only people who are doing it. I mean, Porsche just done this with the Cayenne GTS. Yes. That's gone back from being a V6 to a V8. And yeah, all the better for it. Yeah, because that car yeah. was always the one that made the good noise, the GTS. Yeah. yeah. And that's why people bought it. 
Yeah. They're not buying a super sports car when you buy a Cayenne. Like, no. It's not no. what you're expecting out of that car. Same with the Panamera. No. Like, yeah. It's still big. But then they start the V6 in it and they lost that. Um, and so they've seen sense to put the V8 back in it. And so, yeah, good on them. And the box is probably going to have a six back in it again. Yeah. Um, well, yes. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, it, 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 it obviously does in the, in, in the Spider already. But yes, I mean, there's so much speculation about the next generation of those cars. Um, yeah. uh, my sense is, you know, those cars now come under the, I mean, the boss of the Boxster and the Cayman is the same bloke who looks after the 911s, Dr. Frank Valeser. Uh, and before that, he was the bloke who used to do all the GT cars, right. GT3s and GT2s. Um, and, you know, he is the most enormous petrol head. Um, and he's the bloke who, when I asked him when they were going to do an electric 911, replied, um, sometime after I retire, so I don't get blamed for it. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that there will have to be some degree of hybridization, but what they might just do is just have the options out there. So you could get, you know, a hybrid car or a six cylinder car. Um, yeah. I'll be having the six cylinder car. Yeah. I don't, for me, hybrids at the moment, I haven't come across, all of them seem to be a lot more weight. Yes. Like a lot, like 200 kilos. Yeah. And then you have to have it charged and you get 15 miles. Okay. So the really interesting car is going to be the McLaren, what they call the P16. So the yes. replacement for the 570S, because we know that's got a hybrid in it. We know it's got over 600 horsepower from its V6, whereas the previous one had 500 and something from its V8. Um, and I know Mike flew it fairly well. And I know that he is not going to have allowed the weight to get out of control. I can't see any way that car's going to be, you know, even 100 and something kilos, let alone 200 and something kilos heavier than the car it replaces. Because, you know, I think that I just don't, he just wouldn't he just wouldn't sign off a car like that. I don't, I don't know where I heard it from, but the number I heard was 50 kilos. Yeah. I think that was the number I've heard from yeah. literally I mean, I, I, I've somewhere. heard a number of numbers and they've, they've all got two digits in them. Yeah. And I suspect it's not a particularly high number, even within the two-digit range. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and if they can do that, if they can provide, you know, a car which has a full hybrid drive, and, you know, you have to understand this is all to do with CO2 and fuel consumption. You know, as you, as you said earlier, these things are forced upon the manufacturers, but in a way that doesn't come with a big hike in weight, then, you know, that would be, that would be very interesting. Um, but then again, it's, it's okay for McLaren to do that because they are, you know, they sell very expensive cars when, you know, manufacturers of less expensive cars, um, further down the ranges, you know, whether they'll be able to adopt the same technologies and have the same effect. I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. Yeah. It's tricky. I was, um, talking to, as you do, Christian von Koenigsegg recently. Oh, indeed. Yes. I had him on the podcast and we were talking about hybrids and, and their setup they've got in the, Jamara or Jamara, which sounds that, that in that end of the spectrum, you can do all of the really expensive stuff. Yeah. And you can have a small, well, incredibly small in that, in that car engine that kicks out tons of power. And then you don't have such an issue with the battery side of it because you're generating so much electricity all of the time. Uh, okay. That, yeah. That your batteries don't need to be as big because you can fill them up faster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and people don't expect you to be able to do you know forty miles on electric power alone. So, yeah, yeah, it'll be inter it'll be interesting to see. But you know whether hybrid is in fact the answer to anything. We always sort of used to talk of it, didn't we, as a bridging technology mm. between you know normal combustion engines and the electric cars of our future. I'm increasingly unconvinced that even that electric cars are the future. There are so many problems. So many yeah. problems with electric cars, you know, from, you know, we've talked about their weight and we've talked about their lack of emotion. Nobody's talking about the environmental ramifications of electric cars when you talk about, you know, the rare earth metals that they contain, you know, how you get them out of the earth, what you do with them when the car is done. Um, you know, they all got cobalt in them. Um, which is mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, yeah. um, which doesn't have a great human rights record, particularly when it comes to things like child labour. Um, and nobody is focusing on any of these things at the moment. And in the meantime, you know, there are fuel cells out there 
which don't have range issues. They don't have recharging issues. Um, they just combine hydrogen and oxygen and produce water and, you know, and, and, and off you go. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert at all. And there'll be, I'm sure, any number of very eminent people who would rebuff this. But the more I look at it, the more I think that that ultimately is the way that we have to go. And that hybrid will bridge to electric, which will then bridge to to fuel cells. So whether people are going to spend all those bazillions building the infrastructure that is required for uh, allegedly all electric future um, is, is is an interesting um, question. And if they don't, then we haven't got an all electric future. Yeah, um, I think it's worth th- th- clearly them doing the investment in electric, whether it's cars or not, is is going to be great. Is a good thing, and we need it because if we're going to use we needed more advanced battery tech full stop but Correct. not like outside of the car world like all of our houses will eventually have big battery battery packs in them that yeah. whether that's just a bunch of car batteries wired up or whatever but that we then use solar and yada yada yada, yada. Yeah, so that course. tech yeah. is going to have a huge amount of investment but like you said it we need a massive shift in the tech for it to for we cars do. for it to really work but, it, but it's not just a technological issue. And I think another point that perhaps is not being made enough at the moment is you know, there are all sorts of um, technologies. I mean, the, the, the example that just brings most readily to my mind is the energy-saving light, light bulb. My understanding yeah. is that people knew how to do energy-saving light bulbs years, possibly decades, before they ever hit the market because what they couldn't do was get it to market at the price the customer was prepared to pay. Yeah, And electricity, you know, if you go to an ecotricity station somewhere in the service station yeah. uh, out in the motorway network, if you can find one that's working and you charge your car, it's not cheap. No, it's not at all. Already now, it's not cheap. Now, this is before the government has even thought about how it's going to replace all that tax revenue it's going to lose from petrol. So what's going to happen to the price of electricity? And when we're all charging from home, how are they going to distinguish between the electricity we put in our cars at home and the electricity we use to light our homes or to heat our homes or, or, or to whatever? So, you know, I, I, perhaps they will have some kind of road pricing. I don't know. But there are so many questions out there at the moment, which if people are thinking about them hard enough, they're certainly not making much noise about it. And, you know, I, I remain, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a, a, a true skeptic, but I just don't feel that I know enough. And, you know, yeah. and this is what I do for a living. You know, I'm meant to know. I'm meant to understand this stuff. And I don't feel that I have been in any way informed sufficiently to be able to make, you know, proper judgments about whether these things make sense in, in a whole range of different aspects. Yeah. I, I really hope we don't discount combustion engines as, as a general thing just because it's not considered the way forward right now. Because it, it sounds like definitely with what Christian's doing, we can make them massively more efficient or quite a bit more efficient, significantly less polluting, and you can run them on renewable fuels. Yeah, but the problem is is that you're dealing with with governments and people jumping on political bandwagons. I mean, you know, if people actually listened to the truth, you know, diesel sales would not have, you know, been decimated in, in, in the way that they have. Um, you know, I'm not a big advocate for diesel, but they have been vilified for their emissions without anybody mentioning the fact that they have much lower CO2 than petrol engines. And, you know, ah. and yeah, exactly. But and, you know, and, and so you're going to. There's a massive but. Basically, all the stuff that comes out other than that is horrific for you. Like, oh, the particular yeah. So, 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 what you need is you need a diesel hybrid, so that the moment you're in a city or anywhere that, you know, the, what's coming out of your, do- your your exhaust pipe is seriously hazardous to people's health, you just you just use it with electricity, um, and so you then have the best of both worlds. You know, I did this recently. I had an E class, which was you see the only an E class Mercedes, which is the only diesel hybrid on sale at the mm. moment, um, and you know, and you waft around in the city on electrons, and it's and it's absolutely lovely, and you know, nothing's coming out of your exhaust pipe whatsoever, and then you get out. Um, you know, you get beyond the city limits and you can do hundreds of miles on a single tank um, with very, very low levels of CO2 and enjoy all the benefits of diesel. Um, yeah. So, 
Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, everybody has a different position on these things. But um, I, I was just simply trying to make the point that, you know, whatever Christian might mm. say, and I'm sure that what he says is absolutely right, it doesn't mean that's what's going to happen because, oh, no. you know, politicians will always just, you know, jump on whatever the latest bandwagon is. Yeah, and he, he was very aware of that. And I agree with you, like a diesel hybrid in all these big cars that everyone has sounds like the way, if you're going to do hybrid, diesel hybrid sounds like the way yeah. it's just bad PR. Um but yeah, fundamentally in a hybrid, you have two complete car systems in one car. Yeah, and you're dragging and, them around. And you're dragging that around. And they very, very rarely work efficiently at the same time. In fact, almost never. And in fact, a lot of the time, one or the other of them is switched off. Yeah. Um, at which stage you're literally just dragging hundreds of kilos <laughs> of, of mass around the car. I mean, ugh, don't get me started. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's a whole topic in itself, like yeah. everyone having massive heavy cars for one person. But um, yeah, well, we, we sort of lost our way quite early, 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 early in. You you went to Autocar and you started yes. started working. And then did you stay at Autocar for a long time? I did. I, what did I do? I was at Autocar. So I went there in 88 and I stayed until 96. So I did eight years at Autocar. Um, and I left because I'd been its road test editor for four or five years by then, um, and it was made very clear to me that they weren't going to make me its editor. Um, mm. I was not considered to. I, I, I was too much. I was far too much of an idiot. I was far too much interested in driving fast cars and skidding around and having fun with my mates than I was in serious um, magazine making, which I think is was at the time absolutely fair comment. So. I went freelance um, and sank without a trace um, because I was stupid enough to think that because I would be in the road test editor of Autocar that the world somehow owed me a living and that everybody would ring up and just deluge me with work. Didn't happen. Um, and I was saved by Haymarket buying Motorsport magazine, um, which was in a terrible state having been underinvested in for decades. Um, and they asked me to edit it because it was a tiny little magazine. They didn't really care very much about it. Um, and, you know, they couldn't think of anybody else who was that interested in, in, in old racing cars. So I did that, and I did that for four years. And because it had been in such a bad way, I managed to make myself look quite good because they'd given me a bit of money to invest in it, and we sort of turned it around. Um, and, you know, and, and, and that was a very, very happy period of my life. But then um, I had children, and I needed to earn an amount of money, which I couldn't do in salaried motoring journalism. So I went freelance, and that was 20 years ago. Um, and I've been ploughing my own furrow ever since. <laughs> How but did I mean, you... I've, I've always, I always kept working for all the people I ever worked for. So I still do, yeah. you know, my two, you know, the two magazines I was on were Autocar and Motorsport. My two larger clients to this day are Autocar and Motorsport. And I'm very proud of that. Oh, that's, that's good. So how did you approach freelance the second time round as oh, opposed well, to the first it, it time round? It was much easier the second time round. Firstly, I'd learnt my lesson. So I didn't sit on my ass waiting for the telephone to ring. Uh, and secondly, I had a successful editorship under my belt. Um, and that did count for something. So... You know, I was nothing like as sort of smug and complacent as I had been, um, and it's yeah, you know, it's 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 a world where you know I would hate to be, and I'm sadly with the way things are at the moment, it is happening, and it, I fear it will happen more. Um, you know, if you're a young lad and you know you get made redundant or whatever, you lose your job, and you really have no choice but to go freelance. I think that's really, really difficult. Um, the only reason that I was able to make any kind of success about it, uh, at it at all was by the time I finally went freelance um, in 2000, I'd been, you know, basically, apart from that one little blip, I'd been a salaried motoring journalist for 12 years. Um, so I'd made my name. People knew who I was. Um, and that makes life so much easier because if you send someone an email or ring someone up, you know, they're going to reply to it or pick up the telephone. And so if you are, and also, you know, if you think, oh, I want to do a story about such and such, but that requires you to go to a car manufacturer and borrow some cars and that sort of thing, they're not going to turn around and go, well, who the hell are you? Um, mm. So if you've got that track record, it just makes life so much easier. And, and, and it did. And, you know, the other thing is that I've never... Um, you know, regarded being a freelance as, as anything other than a creative process where you have to have the ideas and you have to pitch them. Um, and I can remember when I was doing motorsport 
people would ring me up and they'd go, um, oh, I'd really love to do some stuff for you. Um, you know, so, you know, bear me in mind the next time you're commissioning something. And I said, well, sorry, it's just not, it's not even close to being good enough. Do you want to work for me? Have an idea. Send me some ideas. I'll tell you if I like them. But just this sort of, you know, oh, I know who you are, therefore, you know, you're going to help me earn my living. I mean, it just, it's just not the way, it's not the way my world works. Um, yeah. And I like the fact that you have to be creative um, because it keeps me on my toes. I mean, I, I thought that by the time I was the age I am now, this business would have been long since shot of me um, because I've always regarded it as a, as a young man's game. And I think the only reason I'm still, you know, um, the, head, the head remains above water is that I, I don't take any of it for granted. I still try very hard to have ideas um, and I do my very best to deliver them to the best of my ability. Where do these so? Where do these ideas spawn from nowadays? Because presumably, obviously, you've done a lot over the last X amount of time. Yeah, but, but there's always there's always something. I mean, you know, um, I'm not a particular fan of what they call anniversary journalism. But you know, I, I'd be lying if I said I hadn't taken advantage of it. Times, you know, there's always it's always the you know the. 50th anniversary or something yeah um <laughs> and so you can you know you, you can do the, do that or there's some new story you could spin something off um or maybe there's something that you haven't visited for a long time and circumstances have changed so you can go back again and look at it in a different way there, there's always something you can do um yeah you know it's like i don't know i don't know what it's like i, I don't know whether it's like music i mean people who you know, of, of my generation are very dismissive of modern music because they say that all the good ideas have already been <laughs> done and, and this, that and the other. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's true in music or not, but I certainly know it's not true in motoring journalism. And at the end of the day, I can't think of an idea to pitch to an editor. I will absolutely walk away and say, thank you very much, guys. I'm done with this business. Um, because it's to me, it's what it's all about. And also that means you get to do what you want to do. Because yeah. finally, I don't pitch ideas, which I think are going to be boring. Um, so, and, and sometimes, you know, goodness knows, I've, I've, I've thought to myself, I'd really like to go and drive such and such. Better think of a way of being able to do that. And then you think up an idea and you pitch it to an editor and you get to go and do it. Um, um, it, it sounds like a good way if you can, like, to, when you can make it work, like a, a, a way to lead a happy life. Like you're oh, fundamentally- it, 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 it is undoubtedly. I mean, you know, there are downsides to it. You know, I look back at uh, my time on motorsport probably as the happiest days of my professional life, just because, you know, I was working with a team of people largely who I'd appointed uh, um, who were really, really good. Mm. Um, and I got to make myself look good on the back of all their hard work, which, which suited me just fine. And I think that if you are in a creative unit with other people like that, I don't think there's a better way of working than that. At the same time, you know, I have done jobs, freelance jobs, where I've been briefly involved in other people's teams, and um, I've not liked or got on with or respected some of the people they're working with, and I can't imagine anything worse than being part of yeah. a team of, you know, of, of people who don't have the same standards as you. So, you know, freelance life, I mean, I am at the moment, I'm sitting, you know, as I do most days when I'm not driving, alone in my shed. Um, you know, I'm talking to you at the moment, but, you know, when we're done with this, I'll be, you know, writing another story. And, you know, that's a very particular way of life. And you have mm. to be, you know, happy with that. I mean, I'm very lucky. I still get to go and see all my mates at Autocar and Motorsport because we do lots of stuff together. So, you know, I, I am involved in that process and I do get to hang out with people. But my day-to-day -day job, is sitting on my own in a shed in the middle of nowhere writing stories. And, you know, I happen to get on particularly well with that. Lots of people don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you miss the... Because I'm I, a similar sort of thing. Like I, I'm generally at home by myself trying to come up with stuff to do, whatever, yeah. work stuff out. Um, and I've got friends that go into, you know, offices all the time and then have that atmosphere. And I do miss the idea of that a little bit sometimes. Yeah, especially but I bet you don't miss the commute. No, none of these um, things. Uh, office politics, you know, and, 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 and all the rubbish that goes with it. I mean, I think I probably even now, because it's been 20 years since I've worked full-time in an office, I probably have a, a fairly sort of rose-tinted view of it all. Um, you know, I, I, I've long since considered myself to be completely unemployable because I can't imagine any job that I would want to do that anybody would ever ask me to do. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of this or nothing for the, you know, and, and, until the business is done with me. Yeah, yeah. Do you find it stressful having that constant pressure to sort of create your own work all the time? I don't think I find it any more stressful than I would find if I was employed knowing that my life was in somebody else's hands. Yep. I like being 
or like at least the illusion of being in charge of my own destiny and knowing that I'm only as good as my last job um, and being able, because I've been doing it for such a long time, being able to pick and choose a bit about not just the stories that I do, but the people I do them for. Um, you know, I worked for the Sunday Times for many years um, and didn't have a good relationship with the person who was my immediate editor towards the end of it. Uh, and I was too scared to give it up. Um, and then eventually things came to a head and it kind of gave me up. And, and I really, really worried about that. But in fact, all that happened was I should have, I, I, I realised I should have done it years earlier. Um, because, you know, I, I, I'm very, very, I think probably what makes me luckiest, feel luckiest of all is I'm no longer at the moment, at least in the position of having to work with people that I don't like or respect. Yeah. Um, I, I can, you know, because I've got enough clients who offer me enough work, uh, who I do get on with that I can I can go and do that. So it, the answer to your question is, I mean, yeah, it, it is a slightly stressy existence because, you know, I always know what I'm doing tomorrow and next week. Uh, I know what I'd like to be doing in a year's time. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing in the periods between those two things. So the medium term is always, you know, an unknown. And also if you're if you're freelance, there is no such thing as the right amount of work because you tend to be working either completely flat out at which stage you don't have the time to go and pitch for more business. And you can kind of see the end of the cliff approaching where you're not going to have any work, but you've still yeah. got lots of work to do. And then you arrive at the end of the cliff and you suddenly got no work and you think, okay, so I need to have some ideas now. And then you go off and you pitch all the ideas and, you know, some of them get commissioned, but then obviously there's a lag, there's a period of time before you can make those happen. And so, you know, your, your life is doing this all the time, you know, and some people I think prefer that, but, you know, you're either... Um, suited to that kind of existence, which I appear to be, or, 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 or you're not. Um, but I, I've, I've certainly been happier with it than, you know, um, I would be otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Your thought about, your sort of point about working with people that you want to work with. Yeah, I'm, it's everything I to me. I was chatting to someone about this very much yesterday and just and that sort of whole like 80-20 thing. But like there will be some people in your life that are causing you all of the stress. Yeah. whether it's working them or whatever reason. Yeah. And I think a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking that they must keep working with all of these people. Because if they don't, they'll, if it's, if it's in a work permit, you'll go, well, if I stop working with that person, I will, I will not have that income anymore. And yeah. in reality, yeah. if you stop working with that person that's stressing you out all the time, you'll probably work more with good people and your the rest of your life will be so much nicer. Yeah, and you'll if, have if that chunk option. of time you saved yourself to go and find some some other nice people. Um, you know, for me in the Sunday Times, it was you know they would you know I basically I did I don't know seventy eighty percent of all their car testing. I mean Clarkson was obviously doing his bit in the in, mm. the, in the in the main bit of the paper, and then you know the sort of the weekly road test I was doing, and. For me, the big fear was, you know, so many cars I'd go and drive for the Sunday Times and then I'd get to write about them for other people. And that's yeah. as a, you know, as a freelancer, the you know, freelance motor journalist, that's how you really earn your living is driving one car and then writing about it for lots of different people. Um, and I thought, well, if I don't do that, if I stop going for the Sunday Times, then I won't be able to get to do that story for all these other people too. And so it won't just be the income from the Sunday Times I lose, yeah. it'll be the income from all those other people too. So that was, that was the really big fear and I was yeah I was I was I'm afraid I was just too scared to give it up when I knew I should have done in fact what happened was um when it did all stop um you know I still got to go on the launches anyway because by that stage I was I was you know, a car of the year Jira um and I was still doing lots of stuff for, for auto car and motorsport and and, and, it, and it was fine but I didn't have the confidence or the courage to to recognize that at the time and I thought you know, life was going to get very tricky, didn't it? It just got massively better. Yeah, but you don't know at the time. <laughs> you know, well, I think, it, I think if some, I think you could sit down if you, and, and if you could be rational about it, which of course you can't, um, because it's important, isn't it? You know, you've got your mortgage. You know, you've got you know children who are looking after. You know, if, if if it was just me and the missus, you know, we just think, well, it doesn't matter, does it? Because it's just us, and we can, yeah. you know, if we end up living in a shed, we'll live in a shed. But when you've got dependence and commitments, um, it's not that simple just to go. Well, I don't like doing this, therefore I'm just not going to do it anymore. Mm. It's um, you know sometimes you have to suck it up. But um, yeah, no, it was. Um, in the end, it, it worked out terribly well for me, but I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. When did you really start, like, did you feel like you sort of honed your road testing ability? Uh, or autocar. I don't think that I am any better a road tester now than I was 
certainly 25 years ago. Um, mm. You know, I used to, I mean, I used to drive 50,000, 60,000 miles a year just testing cars. Um, I would be at the Millbrook test track once, twice a week. I would be, you know, there's a big, big difference between doing what I do now, which is driving cars and writing about them and road testing cars. And by road testing cars, I mean recording all the data, measuring all the measurements, getting all the numbers, and really thinking about a car, not just in terms of, um, you know, whether I like it or not, but clinically, objectively assessing a car in all its component forms. Um, yeah. And, you know, and I did that for years and years. And, and, and it's, that is very much a young man's game because it's an exhausting thing to do, uh, particularly if it's cars that you're not interested in, you know, measuring boot space and rear legroom and all that sort of stuff. Um, so um, I think I got as good at it in terms of my ability to assess a car back then. I think the only thing that's changed since then is I think I'm, you know, I think as you do over time, you hone your writing skills um, and you try so many different things that you kind of end up figuring, figuring out what works and what doesn't. So I think hopefully what I write now is more readable than it used to be, but I don't think it's any better informed. Fair. And ho hopefully more entertaining. Hopefully, hopefully. And, and, and you know, that's the thing. You know, I, I, one of the things that I do from time to time is, I don't know if you use the word, but I kind of mentor junior auto car road testers when they get and, and also people who just have to write drive stories for them and they'll come down to me and we'll go out for a drive and I'll talk to them about um, car evaluation and that sort of thing and and one of the points I always try to get to do is you could write the most you know informative story imaginable but if it's not entertaining no one's going to read it yeah so you've got to do that too um, and, and, and depending on the kind of story you're writing, how you strike that balance um, it is one of the kind of key skills of this job and, and not something that is easily acquired or understood if you've not been doing it for a bit. Mm. Mm. Yeah, totally. What's your, do you have a favourite road test of all time? <laughs> yeah, the McLaren F1, without any question at all, because I know how hard, you know, I tried, to land that test, uh, and I didn't really do the donkey work. The, the, the work was done by Michael Harvey, who was my editor at Autocar at the time, uh, and Steve Cropley uh, and Mel Nichols. And, you know, we knew that car was going to be a game changer. Um, yeah. We'd been very close to it. I'd actually been in it. Jonathan Palmer had taken me around the Nürburgring in, it, in the passenger seat in the wet, which was <laughs> nice. one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Um, and then uh, the weird thing was, um, and the very sad thing was, the day we started the road test procedure, so the day we recorded all the numbers, was May the 2nd, 1994, which was the day after Ayrton Senna had been killed. Mm. And so there was McLaren. You know, there was Jonathan Palmer, and Senna was Jonathan's absolute hero. There was Gordon Murray, who designed, you know, at least in part, Senna's championship winning car. And it was the day after this bloke had just died and we turned up at Brunting Thorpe and I, I didn't even know whether, whether they're going to be there or not. Yeah. And not only were they there, they were so utterly professional about the whole thing. Um, and they did everything that was required of them to help us do this job. Um, and yeah, I, I remember that. Um, I remember finding out a lot of things about myself because this was a car with a performance level so far beyond anything that any of us had ever experienced, particularly in a road car. Um, and I think if you go back and look at that test now, um, yeah, I think we did a good job. I think we did justice to it, um, you know, and what turned out to be and what we knew at the time would be one of the most important um, and certainly interesting supercars that had ever been created. Yeah. Yeah, I know you've you've talked about that test a lot on your own podcast and yeah. in, a, in a lot of places. Do, what do you think is the next F1? Because I, I look back and for me, if you said like one car, you know, when you did the five car garage or whatever, yeah. and like an F1 GTR or an F1 LM is, is in there. But like, yeah. what do you think is going to be the so, next okay, one? Okay, so to me, the car that's always in my car is, 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 is your car. I, I mean, I would actually have an F40 over an mm. F1. Um, but maybe we, that's a, that, that's that, I need that's to drive an F1. That's, Sorry, I need to drive an F1, and then I can yeah, do a direct you need to drive comparison. An F1, so, so, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, an F1 is a massively more impressive, accomplished car. But as you know better than anybody, there's nothing like an F40. Um, but anyway, so the, the, to, to to answer your question, we haven't seen anything since the F1 which has moved the game onto that to that extent you know we've had you know we've had p1 and la ferrari in 918 and Veyron and but, but in terms of game changing um we haven't seen anything like the f1 so i guess it's valkyrie isn't it 
you know, Valkyrie is you know, has the same kind of ethos behind it in terms of being designed by the greatest Formula One designer of his era, in the, this case in the form of Adrian Newey, um, with that same, you know, ultimate focus on lightweighting. Very different sort of car, obviously, because the Valkyrie is very much going to be a, uh, you know, a, an ultimate downforce, see how fast you can get a car to go kind of car, mm. whereas the F1 was always designed to be, you know, as comfortable and spacious and refined as it was fast. So it's a different concept. But in terms of moving the boundaries of what we always thought a road car could do, um, the Valkyrie and the AMG, well, we used to call it Project One, didn't we? But it's now just the yeah. AMG One. Um, as and when that sees the light of day, I guess we'll, you know, be there with the Valkyrie at, at the same time. But yeah, um, I mean, I just don't know how far, how much further these cars can go. It's, um, you know, we've now it's... got cars doing 300 miles an hour and <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's all mad, isn't it? And I, really I was... It's all completely mad. I had, I, and I hadn't really thought about this, but as I had Darren Turner on uh, last week, week before, and yeah. he was talking about de- the, doing some of the development stuff with the Valkyrie. And the thing that he'd, he's normally brought in to handle sort of race car type stuff sure. and the track side and things like that. But he was saying the thing with the Valkyrie is it's designed to be a road car yeah. and they're designing it to be a road car. Yes, it needs to do all these other things. And then I look at it and go, okay, but if it's designed to have like the levels of downforce it's going to have, yeah. how the hell do you make it okay on a road? I just don't understand. Like the sti- Normally you have to have crazy stiff springs and all that stuff to handle the downforce, but presumably yeah, they're do. doing some cl- yeah. trick stuff. And, and and also, you know, you've also got to. It's also got to be on a on a road tire, yeah. Um, which will have a load limit, um, which will be presumably way below the maximum amount of downforce that car is technically capable of generating. So I think what they will do, well, I think what we know they will do is obviously there they'll, they'll, they will be the track version, but there will also be a track pack for the for the normal road version. So you'll be able to go to a track and you know put your different clams on and bolt your slicks on and everything else because. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, there are certain limitations, um, you know, legal limitations of ground clearance and having treaded tires and everything else that, um, you know, make generating that amount of downforce probably impossible, um, and if not that, certainly extremely difficult and 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 maybe completely car compromising. So I think what you need to be able to do is adapt the car when you get to the track. So, yeah. you, you know, you drive effectively one car to a track and then you get another one when you're there, when you're there because, I, you know, I'd, like you, I can't see how a car with road legal levels of ground clearance and treaded tyres can generate the kind of downforce that we think it's going to be able to generate. Yeah, it, and then that, that car, along with when we talked about the Vulcan a little bit as well, are designed for customers to drive. Yeah. You know, they're not designed for professional race car drivers. Yeah. So... I'm just really intrigued as to like what something with in theory that level of performance but is designed to be easy to drive is going to yeah. be like whereas most stuff with that level well everything with that level of performance pretty much now is designed to be super sharp and proper race car. Yeah, I mean it's interesting, isn't it? I mean the thing the thing is is that if you drive something like a P1 GTR Um, which is, you know, another one of these kind of quasi-racing cars, but Mm. which has to be driven by customers. Um, They have to set them up differently. That's why it's one of the reasons why, you know, they don't lap, their, their lap times aren't perhaps quite as fast as you would imagine that they would be, because they deliberately have to be set up in such a way that they are controllable by, by mere mortals. And also the other thing is that racing cars, you know, things like GT3 cars, uh, which are designed purely to extract a lap time, um, they're not actually, you know, in many ways that nice to drive because they are set up so that you can just brake as hard as you can all the way into the apex. And then you literally take your foot off pressing one pedal as hard as you possibly can to pressing the other pedal as hard as you possibly can. Yeah. And there's none of that sort of bit in the middle where you're doing this. It's yeah. just all that and then all that. And um so yeah so 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 they have to set them up as you say for um you know more, mere, mere mortals rather than racing drivers so i mean i i don't know how they're going to do it um 
I suspect that, you know, almost all Valkyrie owners will never get anywhere close to what their cars can do. And I think for them, that doesn't matter very much. I think what they like to know, it's like people who never take their Range Rovers off road or, you know, yeah. never, you know, they just like to know that they, their cars can do it, even mm. if they never do. And I think that for them, that'll, pro- I think they'll just love the idea of it being in an Adrian Newey car and the fact that they can get in it and they can drive it to their absolute limit of what they can do. And they could probably scare themselves senseless in it while at the same time thinking to themselves, well, actually, you know, the car itself has got like this much margin still. Yeah. Um, and so knowing that ultimately they're going to be fairly safe doing it. I imagine all of those cars, I, I, I think occasionally you talk to people do a bit of racing and stuff and you look at some of those cars like p1 gtr and that sort of stuff and you go oh they're a bit pointless and like what's the, you know why don't you just get like an actual race car and then i think about it and i go okay well hang on a minute if if you put a billion pounds in my bank account i would have those cars like a <laughs> fxxk like a v12 <laughs> like you can't buy a modern racing car with those sorts of engines in no, you can't. And you know, and you know, you you in your in your SR three, um, you know, you would be able to get around around a track in your SR three on slicks faster than almost any road car. You know, faster than any road car of, of, of how fast it is. Probably faster than it, than, than any road car. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's exactly what you say. You know, why have you know a car like that which costs millions when you can go out and spend you know a five figure sum or something like a, an SR three. And go faster, and the answer is it's not just about the going fast, is it? Yeah. It's you know you, you, people who buy those sorts of things, um, they buy into a brand, they buy into a look, um, they buy into the rights to hang out with other people like them who get to do that sort of thing. There are so many other things going on. It's not just about because if we just wanted to go and drive around tracks fast, we'd all go and have SR threes because we know how brilliant they are. Yeah. We know how fast they can go. We know how affordable they are to run. But it's yeah. not quite as logical or straightforward as that. No, it's it's all of the other stuff. And yeah, you, you, even if you're setting a lap time that's like GT3 pace, you don't have that V12. No. <laughs> and no. like, I want that. Yeah. You know, your, your yeah. car's not shooting massive flames and you've got all your car, sick carbon everywhere. Yeah. No, they're, they're cool things. And I, I think it's interesting. What do you think of the T50? <sighs> Well, you know, who knows? I mean, who well, knows? Who knows? Yeah. you know, I, I, um, I've, I've sat down with Gordon and we've had a, a good long chat about it. And, you know, I've seen it and I just love the, you know, Gordon is a remarkable man because you just sort of sit there and it's, it's like sort of being on top of a mountain. Suddenly the air clears. <laughs> and, and all this kind of confusion and everything which goes on in a normal person's head like mine, which is just sort of, oh, I don't know about this, uh, fuss and dither and dither. And you talk to Gordon, it's just like, well, it's so bloody obvious. Do this. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And this is the result. And I just love the clarity of that man's thought process. Um, and, you know, the, okay, so what have I driven of his? I've driven, obviously, the uh, the F1 um, and the Rocket. And... Mm. You know, the man who has created those cars, uh, who's now doing the T50. I mean, yeah, it, it, it should, I mean, you mustn't prejudge anything, um, but it should be absolutely fantastic. And and the fact that it hasn't got a bazillion horsepower and it has got a manual gearbox and it does weigh less than a ton, um, these sorts of things speak to me. Yeah. Um, because you know, the, again, it's you know, it's it's this thing about thinking, you know, when they conceived that car, they were kind of thinking of me because all the things that I want a car to be, you know, manual, V twelve, light, compact, yada yada yada. That's what it is. So, um, yeah, I just can't wait. Uh, it's just going to be unbelievable. I was you know, again talking to a couple of people today, and they're like, I don't understand how you can get remotely excited about that car. And I was like, well, okay, if we can ignore the price for a bit and looks subjective whether you like it or not you just have to read the spec sheet and for me that is just like this is going to tick so many boxes look at the engineering and look at if you get to see the car look at the pedals look at the detail i mean everything on it is just it's just magnificent it is in Um, a modern car that's the size of a boxster that's got loads of luggage space yeah like it's the absolute opposite of the sf90 (laughs) well yeah I yeah, and, and 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 probably, I was about to say, not much more than half the weight. Um, but you know, an SF ninety will certainly weigh more than half as much again. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's been, I, mean, the, I know we've all talked about it, so I won't bang on, but you know, what Ferrari does with the SF90 or how far down that road it chooses to go uh, uh, is, is one, something which really, really interests me at the moment. There's, um, um, I, I saw a, a video this week. I don't know whether you've seen it. It was going around Twitter and whatnot um, of someone in an 812 driving over, I think it was Lambeth Bridge in London, and they have put a GoPro on their head and they've turned everything off you can, and this is where the, like the little Ferrari geek looks in, and you can see where the Manatino's at. Yeah, yeah. And they boot it going over the bridge, and you can hear there's absolutely zero traction control, anything coming in, and it just goes, yeah. and then, oh no, loses it, smashes straight into the wall, nearly hits a cyclist, like airbags go off, proper big crash, and the and reason they I thought posted it, this. And they posted it or they shared it. I don't understand. Like maybe they sent it to a mate and then the mate sent it to everyone else. But it was, it spawned an interesting conversation and someone had the attitude and I disagree with this attitude, but he was like, well, that car's clearly got too much power or the electronic systems should have saved him. And then you point out that like he turned everything off. And like, yeah, but this, it should, this, you know, there's, there's cars that, even if you turn everything off, they still save you. And for me, the idea, I love the fact that that, not, it's very unfortunate he crashed a car, but I love the fact that even now, today, you can turn everything off if you want. But you've got but to be aware that you've turned if, everything off. You know, if, if, so what are you saying? That you remove choice from the individual and you um, remove responsibility from the individual. What you're actually saying is you can buy an 812, but you're such an idiot, or all our customers, because it has to be the same for us, are such idiots, we're going to give you this ability and then not let you use it. Or we're going to get to choose yeah. how you, as a private individual, get to get to use it. I mean, where does it end? No. Um, you can't. I mean, it's absolutely right that the systems are on these cars. And it's absolutely right that when you turn the car on, all the systems default to on. Yes. Um, but beyond that, you have to be able to choose. It's mad. And, you know, and, and, and if you choose to be an absolute bloody idiot, then, you know, that's your choice. And if you hurt somebody else, well, then there are consequences for you for doing that because you're going to get banged up or whatever, and rightly so. Um, but, you know, if you completely relieve people of their ability to be irresponsible, which sounds slightly seductive because, you know, of course, who would want anybody being interrupted? What you're also removing from people is their individual liberty to decide what, how they're going to live their lives. Um, and it's not worth it. No. And there's always a place and a time where you can. So you could go to a racetrack and turn everything off. And that's yes. that's clearly the, the... Or an open space or something. That's yes. when everyone should try everything off and, and and if you bury it in the barriers well you know you bury it in the bar in, yeah. in the barriers and, and that's down to you and that's your fault and you know and even if there are other people out on the track with you you know they all absolutely know the the, the rules i mean the terms of engagement it's like with people you know i race i race really dangerous old cars i mean mm. i race pre-war cars and you know um <laughs> and, and you know places like goodwood and people have often said you know when something's happened that um you know, that kind of racing should be banned because it's just so dangerous. Um, forgetting the fact that all of us who do it absolutely understand what we're getting into. We choose to get into these cars with no grip and no brakes and no safety systems, whatever, no yeah. safety belts or anything, and drive around a, a, a track as tricky as Goodwood in whatever weather happens to be around at the time. And nobody makes us get in the cars. Nobody is holding a gun to our heads. Um, and if it goes wrong, you know, then we'll bear the consequences of that. The only time that it becomes difficult and the only thing you absolutely have to make sure is that no members of the public get involved because, you know, they haven't signed the yeah. forms. They don't, um, they, they, they should not be exposed to that level of risk. And this is, you know, there's probably another conversation, but this is, you know, one of my problems in modern motor racing is that everybody who goes racing understands the risks. Um, and the, the more risk you remove from motor racing, the more bland and boring that racing becomes. Um, and so long as members of the public aren't getting involved, I think people should be free to race the way that they want to. Yeah, totally. Like it's, you know, you know the rules. You've agreed. Yeah. yeah. And like it's I mean, 2020. There, there, there was once, a, there was, I won't mention names or go into details because, you know, somebody died, but there was once a fatality at a race meeting. I wasn't in the race, but I was, at, I was racing on that weekend and I was um, at the track. 
And because I was, you know, people knew me and what I did, um, this person who died, widow, rang me up because she was understandably, you know, beyond, um, you know, she was absolutely traumatised and was trying to understand the circumstance of what had happened and everything else. Um, And she hadn't got to the stage where she was going to start because some people get litigious and start suing people. But, I mean, I did have to say to her that everybody you know, who is in that race and every other race, you know, understands that these things are not risk-free. And and once you accept that, um, you also accept that there are times when it might be you. And if you don't like that, then it's absolutely fine. I completely understand it. Don't get in the car. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's a certain, if there's, I mean, there's certain cars that like, you you know, you list that you, you'd race or like an old F1 car or something like yeah. that. And like, I look at it and go, yeah, no, I'm, that's not for me because yeah. I, I think the risk is too absolutely bonkers. But yes. then other people make their own decisions. Yeah, I mean, Danny, Daniel Ric- Ricciardo, who is, you know, who, is, who is not a wimp, you know, he came out the other day and said, no way would he race at the old Nürburgring. He's, you yeah. know, he's been round it and he's gone, you are kidding. I just <laughs> don't want to do that. And, you know, and he's not a wimp. He, he's not a coward. He's, it's just not for him, as you were saying. It's just not something that he would choose to spend his time doing. So there's no right or wrong about it. It's not one a lot of people go, oh, I'm braver than you. It's just, no. if you have a passion, I mean, I never do anything. I hate, you know, horror movies, roller coasters. I, don't, I never do anything for the point of being scared. But there are things I love doing so much that there is a level of attendant risk I'm prepared to take in order to be able to do it. And yeah. that's a very different thing. And yeah, um, and you do as much. And, and if I'm doing something like that, I do as much as I can to make sure there's no unnecessary risk. Of course. Of you know, course. If, if it's your, your car, make sure it's prepped properly. Like, make, do all the safety stuff. Like, yeah. Or you're going, whatever, you're skiing off piece or something. Either get a guide or learn your stuff. Like, yeah. These course. things go wrong, but do as much as you can to print that and then to come sort of full circle back to the, this Ferrari 812 like what is the point in Ferrari making a car with 800 horsepower or whatever it is if at no point in time do you get to experience the reality of 800 horsepower no so the answer to that is they would say well you can't you shouldn't have cars with 800 horsepower and they you would. should you know you should limit and you know and and and, and the world just becomes a more boring less enjoyable place to be it does it does and then luckily for us you can still go out and drive these older things whether it's something like an f40 or go and race some old stuff and i find with the idea it's something that puts me i I would if someone offered me a seat in a gt3 car i would love to go and do it but all of the racing i've done up to this point has all been no aids no traction control no nothing yeah and that is a huge part of it yeah, I'd be very interested to see if you, if you did go and race a, a a car which had a few systems on it and a bit of downforce, you might come out of it and think that was a really interesting experience, but I don't, I don't need to do that anymore. Um, yeah, I think you, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because it's something different. And Exactly, yes, it, and, and, it, and it always is. But, you know, I, I, you know the, the GT3 cars I've driven, I've always been really interested in them um, and, and very impressed by them. Um, but... I've never, you know, tried to put myself out there and tried to push to get to go and, and race them. I raced GT4 cars, um, mm. and yeah, you know, they've got a bit of downforce, and you know, and, and actually, a modern GT4 car is quicker than a GT3 car was ten years ago. So you're kind of nibbling around that kind of level, and I've really, really enjoyed it. But if I think about skidding about the place in a you know 1960s <laughs> cars on skinny little Dunlops, um, yeah. that's what makes me smile. You know, that doesn't particularly you know, fill my brain with lots of cerebral thoughts. I'm just too busy having a good time. Yeah. And, you know, and ultimately, you know, it, it, the, these things like, it, you know, for me, quite a bit of it is um, is, is my work, but, but mainly um, I race for fun. And if you're not having a good time, why are you out there? No. And I think it's pretty much universally agreed that more slip angle is a bit more fun. <laughs> to some extent, uh, yeah, well, it, it, it certainly should be. It certainly should be, and you know, and, and and I also think that people mistake fast for fun. I mean, I have had honestly, I have had more fun driving a sixteen hundred cc Alpha GTA 
mm. um, you know, made in 1965 in the wet around Donington than I have had driving cars with monstrous slicks and the power and downforce. Because it's what you say, just you know, balancing a car on the limit, frankly, it's why we do it, isn't it? It's why we drive cars yeah. on tracks. It's, you know, and it doesn't really matter how fast you're doing it as long as you've got, and, and, and in many ways, the faster you have, to, you have to be going to do it, the more difficult it becomes, the more intimidating it becomes, the harder it becomes. Whereas if it's all nice and accessible, it's still it's still great fun. And I say I don't do this stuff to scare myself. I do it to enjoy myself. And you know, and if that enjoyment is more easily found at a more accessible level, then that's entirely good news to me. Yeah. And whenever I interview a, a racing driver, and I've had a few couple of good ones on, and they all say pretty much universally, like if you were going to go race something tomorrow, like to, for fun, what would you do? And it's like they just want to drive something that's kind of with a grid that's as close as possible yeah, and kind of slow in a laugh rather than yeah, just exactly. I mean, you, million you, pound you, car. You said you, you, you said you had Darren on. Well, he'll tell you. Um, absolutely. You know, he goes off and he drives all sorts of, you know, modern Le Mans cars and that sort of thing. But I bet if you said to Darren, you know, just for fun, would you rather be there or on the grid at the Revival in something with quite a lot of power and not much rubber? Yeah. I, I can't speak for him, but I would be staggered if he didn't say, Take me to the revival every day of the week. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, we we talk, I talked about this, and I was like, if you were going to go race something random and fun, it's like I'd love to get a bunch of mates and do an MX five race. Yeah, and just like have a laugh. Yes. And the, the the not having the consequences or less consequences does make stuff more fun. Like I, even in the I say even in, in in the radical, there's certain corners on certain tracks. Let's say like brands out the back something with a high downforce, like you're aware that you get it wrong and you leave the track at like 120 and you drop mm. and you fly about 15 meters and you hit something very solid. Yeah. Like, whereas if you're in something on skinny, skinny tires, that might be 60 miles now. Yeah. Yeah. You won't fly so far and you won't hit so hard. Yeah. I mean, I, I know it's, 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 it's there, there's, there's, there's a lot to be said for it. Um, no, I just, I just love racing all that old stuff. Mm. I'd love to do a bit of, a bit of old, Old, old and slidey, old and slidey, or even you know, I've I've done, um, you know, I've done well, just talking about MX five racing. I've done lots of MX five racing, and it's just, yeah, I mean, it's not expensive, it's not complicated, it's just, it's just fun. You're just skidding around in cars, and um, they, they do it as well as any. Yeah, yeah, absolutely awesome, fun. Right. Well, I normally wrap this up with five questions. Oh blimey. Okay. Do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey? How long have I got to answer each question? Um, as long as you most like. Memorable driving trip or journey? Oh bloody hell! Yes, uh, the McLaren F1 when we left Bruntingthorpe Circuit, having done all the numbers, and I had to drive it to the North Yorkshire Moors by myself, and I probably found out more about myself as a driver on that <laughs> one run than anything else. And at the end of it, I can remember handing it over to someone, and. Far and away, the strongest feeling I had, and pretty much the only feeling I had was one of relief was that me and the car were still in one piece. Because to be honest with you, I was in my 20s at the time, and someone had just given me, you know, a McLaren F1. And I don't think at the time it was a given I'd have made it there, but I did. And yeah, it's probably the most memorable road car journey I've ever had. <laughs> was that a, what was particularly notable? You just pushing the limits a little bit. Yeah, it was just its ability to get from one speed to another with le by leaving out all the speeds in between. It was just, I mean, you know, any straight. Now, I mean, I can't mention numbers now because, you know, you can't own up to these things in public. No. But um, the, just its ability to put absolutely ridiculous numbers on the dial and, and just that realisation that even if you were completely on the correct side of the road, even if you weren't sliding or anything, you could be travelling so fast that another road user could see that and be so spooked by that they could do something yeah. completely unexpected. Um, and also the other thing is that, you know, if you come down a long, long straight and you're doing some ridiculous speed and there is a car at the far end of that straight, he or she might reasonably look out and think, that car's a long way away, I can pull out now, not understand yeah. it. And so all these sorts of things. Um, and that car kind of taught me to build in those margins um, to a greater extent than I ever had in, in anything else before. Mm. There is, I've had it, once or twice, whether I've been in a passenger seat or driving, when you other road users and either make really, really bad decisions. You could just be overtaking someone sensibly, and for some reason they decide they don't want you to overtake them, and then they pull out. 
Yeah. Or like they speed up as you go past. Yeah. These sorts yeah, of situations the, the, where I've had two, two like that, which were, they weren't ridiculous overtakes. I wasn't going crazy, crazy fast, but the person just decided that they didn't want me to overtake at that point in time. Because they've probably seen what kind of car you, what you were in and possibly taken against you just from that alone. And, but I, I, it's that mindset in itself blows my mind because I just don't understand the rational thought process that, that goes into, you know what I'll do? This person's annoying me for whatever reason. I don't want them to overtake. So I'm going to potentially cause a massive crash. Yeah. I'm going to make, I'm going to do my best to make sure he has an enormous accident. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course, that's not what they think at the time. They just think, I don't want that person to come past. And yeah. they don't think through the consequences of their actions. And if they did, they'd be utterly appalled. But in that moment, um, when the mist comes down, they just think, well, sod you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the gap. And yeah. But don't yeah, I, I don't think there's anybody who certainly does what I do, do for a living who hasn't experienced that on a few occasions. Yeah. And, you, and yeah. You, these situations happen. And you, all, all you can do as a driver is live and learn and try and pick up on whether it's the way it's amazing when you're following in a car especially on a road but also and very much on a racetrack where you can understand so much about the driver by in a really short period of time just by following them yeah the language of the road it is Mm. such an important thing isn't it um and only experience teaches you that um you know i so many times i've been you know um teaching my daughters how to drive and we've been down a road and We've been following a car, and I've just been able to tell them what that car's about to do. Yeah. Um, just because you, you know, you can just see the way they address the road, and you know what kind of driver they are, uh, and yeah, and and that's something. Again, I, I don't think that's something that you can um, just do. I think it's something that you have to learn. Yeah, it's an it's a very interesting one, and it's very difficult to explain to someone yeah. at the time that process you're like but, no but I just know it's one of the things that keeps you safest on the roads and you can't teach it in a driving test and yeah. it's just one of those things that you just have to acquire over time yeah yeah five car garage unlimited value five car garage unlimited value okay well we've already mentioned the F40 yeah. um, I have to have a racing car in there which in my case will be a load of T70 Mark 3B mm. um, I have to have something pre-war in there because I love pre-war cars and I love pre-war Bentley so I'd have a 1934 and a half litre Bentley how many cars is, cars is you, that? you've done three you've got two uh, left that's three okay so I mean it goes without saying you've got to have a 911 in there uh, that's going to be my everyday car so I will have a manual Carrera S, please, a new 992. Ooh, um, interesting. And I've got one other thing, haven't I? Um, recreated 250 short wheelbase. There you go. Nice. Would you have... Would oh, you no, have I've got that? two Ferraris in there. That's boring, isn't it? I've got two Ferraris. <laughs> oh. That's all right. Yeah. And I've already got my racing car. Oh, dear. You've got a Porsche. I've got a Porsche. I've got yeah. I've got my. I've got my F40. Okay, we'll stay with that for now. I'll so stay how with come short wheelbase. You would get a C2 a base Carrera 992 manual yeah. over well all of the other 911s, I guess. Yeah, because if, this, this, if you're going to have a five car drive, you've got to have a car you use every day. And I would just have a base 992 um, on iron brakes without any of the tricks. And it would just be, I'd just, I'd just use it like a, a Ford Focus. I, mm. You know, I'd never clean it. I'd just live in it. And, <laughs> you know, I would just use a 911 for what 911s are best to be used for. Yeah. And it would do that job very well. Beautifully. If you could only drive one car for the rest of your life. As an everyday car? It, uh, you're, you're allowed a 500 banger on the side. 500 pound banger on the side. One car. Mm. Well, F40, isn't it? That's boring. That's a really boring answer. Okay, so F40, if you say that you can't use the F40 because you because if you only got a 500 bang banger, you're going to want to be in that whatever the car and what why the range of scenarios. So as an alternative to that, Gen 2 997 GT3 RS. Oh, oh. Have you got one of those as well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, well, you'll know that Porsche has one. Um, yeah. Porsche GB has one. Hebe. And, and Hebe, exactly. And Hebe is pretty much my, of the cars that I'm ever likely to get to drive on anything like, a, not even regular basis, but even an occasional basis, he, Hebe for me is the thing. Because yeah. the thing about Hebe is, what's it got, 450 horsepower, something like that? Yeah. Um, I've never driven that car and wished that I had more power. Um, the way, the feel, the communication, well, you know this because you've got one of the bloody things. Um, I'm, just, I'm just happier in that car than I am in just about everything else. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's an amazing car. My only problem with mine at the moment is it's got a cage in it. 
and it yeah. makes luggage more of a problem. Yeah. And it just yeah. means I use it less, but okay. Okay. other than that, it's so, really great. But also the other thing about those cars is that it actually does ride well enough to be able to use it. Uh, it's not, you know, you're not pinging off every bump. Um, you do have some luggage, but it is actually a genuinely usable car. I absolutely love them. Yeah, and you've got your nav and whatever. And... So you've got an F40 and a, and a Gen 2 997 GT3 RS. Hmm. Yeah, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you've got two of the cars. Anyway, hey, moving swiftly on. Next one, next one. Okay, uh, I'm going to give you... What's best value car under 50K? Alpine A110 Pure, which I think are about 47, 48K. Um, mm. There are very, very few of them. I think they'll hold on their residual value amazingly well. And if you just like, if you want to, if, if, if a Martian fell to earth and said, you know, what should a car be like to drive? You just stick him in that. Um, and then they kind of get it because as I've said before, it's not about power or grip or anything like that. It's about feel and light and communication, yeah. and that sort of thing. It does all of that. Mm. Okay. 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 Right. Most undervalued car. Most undervalued, what's so an old car? I mean, if, if I was going to buy an old car. Old car. What do you think should be worth more than it is? Oh, okay. Uh, what do I, uh, an E46 BMW M3. Mm. Possibly the best M car there's been. Um, and right now, cheap as bloody chips. They um, are. Brilliant, beautiful engine, amazing balance, got a fantastic diff in the thing, which means you could just, re- I mean, yeah, just, yeah, and they are. Well, relative to what they should be, they are buttons at the moment. And if I was minded to go and invest a car in the car, I would buy the best possible one of those that I could, but I'd still use it. Yeah. No, I, I think there's a serious thing for the E46. I, I love yeah. them. I've, yeah, at the some point, I've, I've got to own one of them. One. Yeah. Um, okay. And c- certainly, the best, but the, the, certainly there hasn't been a better M3 since. Ooh. There you go. We yeah, fair, fair. Right. Most, and final question, we're having six. Most interesting car. What are you giggling? What are you looking up? Most interesting car. Hmm. To you at the moment. T50. The Z50. T50. T50, yeah. Um, because, I mean, before I knew about the T50, the F1 would have been it just because of the the innovation in it and the, as I said earlier, the clarity of the thought that's gone into it. Um, and... Yeah, the T50 seems to be all that and in spades. I'm absolutely fascinated by that. There's no car in which I'm more interested at the moment than the than the T50. So there you go. Yeah, it's a very cool thing. And hopefully we'll see some in not too long. I don't know how I don't know what the timeline they've said is. Probably another year, I guess. I think he said he'll have one working this year, and I think he reckons he's gonna deliver cars next year. Now whether COVID puts that back or not, I don't know. But um yeah, I just, I just, I, I don't care where. I just want to drive one, and I, yeah. I, and I kind, and I kind of, well, I really, really hope that I do. I'm sure you'll get to have a go. I think. So. Who knows? When, when you never take these things for granted. You can well, never no, kind true, of assume true. that you're going to be on the list because you know there are going to be so few people to get to do that. Um, and just because I did the F1 half a lifetime ago, that doesn't mean I'm going to get to do this now. But I, I, I would love to think that I was at least um, under consideration. Yeah, get that pitch in early yeah. <laughs> if it's not in already uh, and definitely if, if you could chuck me the keys to any car that i can see on the sort of horizon or whatever that's, that's the, the one. one i really 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 want to just experience yeah. and then i want yeah. them to make a, another one that's cheaper and then a one that's cheaper than that <laughs> yeah i mean i think they will i mean i don't know this but i think they will because i can't imagine that the, the the gordon just thought i'm just going to do this as a one off and then go back to doing consultancy yeah. i imagine that this is um a sort of a, a curtain raiser i can't say the hope it is and and that there will be cheaper more affordable cars to come but i guess we'll have, we'll have to wait and see we will see and hopefully regulations won't stamp them out yeah. in the numbers that they'll yeah. have to be in yeah. but cool well thanks very much for coming on the podcast it's been a very great pleasure it's been um, good. i hope i haven't stayed too long it's been no. really really good fun bang on bang on time excellent <laughs>